Good afternoon and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us with Office Hours. I'm Norm, and I'm grateful to have each one of you participating here today on Zoom, as well as for those that are watching this afterwards on YouTube. Uh, thanks for checking this out. Uh, today, our topic is social media and the way in which Strong Towns engages with social media in order to help build a movement uh, for change in our community. And I want to focus on two core segments in the, especially the opening 30 minutes with Katie Kelly, who is our social media coordinator at Strong Towns. Uh, Katie is doing a remarkable job in the work that she's doing. And I want to take a look at two sort of core segments here. The first is a behind the scenes look at our operations uh, for those who are curious about such things. And I'm mindful that that's a little bit of inside baseball, a little bit of that stuff. But I feel like there's always this curiosity, especially for members, to, to look under the hood, to see what's happening, and, and really to know how uh, the contributions that you're sharing with Strong Towns are being used and, and furthered through uh, the work that Katie is able to do with the social media operations that we're running. And so uh, that's an element of it. But then also another... Um, angle of this is something like a tutorial on how to do social media. I'm convinced that Katie is extremely good at this. And therefore, I wanted to ask her a bunch of questions. Just how does this work? What are some of the implications for different strategies, uh, different things like that as we go on? As always, feel free to jump in the chat and drop comments in there. You can have can carry on a parallel conversation in the chat. Uh, there's no problem in doing so. Uh, that's part of what makes uh, office hours fun and lively. And if you want to share resources or click over to art other articles or things like that that you found to be exciting, or even if you want to pitch something directly to Katie that show, should go eventually into our social media feed, uh, feel free to do so as well. But I want to start by asking you, Katie, would you just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about uh, what brought you here at Strong Towns and now is uh, preparing you for, I mean, giving you the the, the base from which now you're building uh, this whole Strong Town social media empire? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that introduction, Norm. Um, so my name is Katie Kelly. As Norm said, I'm the social media coordinator here at Strong Towns. And I joined last November, so I still kind of feel like I'm the new kid on the block, which has been really exciting. Um, a little bit about my background, what brought me here. I became really passionate about Strong Town's ideas probably about a year and a half ago and have been deep diving as much as I possibly could on my own. So that was a lot of my preparation. But professionally in the past, I've been kind of a internet digital media jack of all trades for many different media platforms as well as uh as well as working as a digital advisor role for Canadian small businesses for a while, right before I started this business. So I have some background in social media management, some in web design, some in content creation and writing, a little bit of everything. And I think that that experience gave me a good place from which to work coming into a social media coordination role, since I can understand a little bit about what's going on in all of the departments. And I... More personally, I think what really has prepared me for this role in particular with Strong Towns is I've had for a long time kind of an endless fascination with how the internet works, how internet communities work, how ideas and communities online interact, how the flows of information and the flows of belief systems uh, move through this digital space, not a physical space, but there are kind of avenues, channels, and things like that. Um, so that's something that I've been really personally interested in, in studying. And I've spent a lot of time kind of embedding myself in like various online communities just to understand what they think, how they think, what the differences are, what the shared roots are, what kinds of things might make them excited, what kinds of things might make them angry. And uh, <laughs> a lot of that is because I'm really passionate about trying to like bring together people of opposing viewpoints and build healthier communities. I think Strong Towns is the best way to do that. Um, get people from online connecting in person face to face uh, because that's where the most understanding happens. So yeah, that's a little bit about me. Um, I'll segue it back. Yeah. Well, let's let's jump in and, and ask um adjust the fact that like strong town started as a blog which is one type of the social media sort of empire and really one of i think a really important part of that early stage of building up this sense that every you know the internet began with like little message boards and and gave rise eventually uh to uh blogs and things like that and the blog is still a central part of our media strategy it's where we post our articles it's where we post resources and things like that 
But we also see that our views on our social media platforms are way higher than on our website. How do you approach that tension or challenge or reality in your role as a social media coordinator? Oh, that's a good, that's a good question. Yeah, so definitely a, a big challenge, especially now as these social media platforms have matured, is every social media platform, the way that they earn money is by keeping your attention on the platform. So these platforms, like not only do people browsing the platform favor content that is meant to be on the platform and not direct you to a blog or to something deeper off of it, they actually algorithmically very much favor uh, things that do not link away and suppress things that look like they're trying to get you to go somewhere else. So that's a really interesting challenge for a movement like this where ultimately our goal is to have people you know, working together to build up their places in person, um, but it's a lot of fun. So I think there's a part of the way that I handle this is I kind of segment in my own mind what, which posts in my head are more oriented around growth, things that I think are, are likely to, to spread faster, uh, which ones are more towards nurturing an audience or educating an audience like on a social media platform in a little bit of a deeper way. Um, and these ones probably aren't going to get the most views or the most shares, sometimes they do, and they surprise us, and that's amazing. Um, but they're more about you know putting out guides and how-tos, discussing a more subtle point on social media. And then there's posts that are meant to bring someone towards an article. And then there's posts that are meant to convert someone to, like suggest that someone might wanna to go to an event or become a member or something like that. So those are kind of the different categories in like descending order of, how challenging it is to get engagement on social media with them. And I'll just give an example of this where we had to grapple with the fact that people weren't showing up on our website because the platforms wanted everyone to stay on the platform. So touching on Danny's question there. And so one of the strategies, do you want to touch on just the way that you're using, uh, for example, this sort of two part strategy where we've yeah. got the thread that actually like has the link? What What are some of the thoughts that went into that? Yeah, so this one is for an article. Um, and a lot of times, this one didn't get tremendous engagement, but a lot of times if you have like a, a killer headline, just a screenshot of an article is something that makes people feel like they're already uh, part of it. But a, a strategy that I'll use quite a bit. So this is another good example here with the traffic deaths for Yes on HLA. Um, this was a, this is talking about a podcast, which was about a measure that just passed in Los Angeles where they're going to, improve safer street design with every maintenance project. Um, and so what I'll often do is create a post that's oriented you know, towards the platform itself and then have a secondary reply or a secondary slide that contains the link. Um, and that's a strategy that can work quite well. Um, you might have to scroll down a little bit further, but if you find like a before and after image or, or one of these mm. more oriented um, memes or something like that, Sometimes, um, yeah. Oh, this is um, over on yeah. Instagram, but yeah, I mean, we're, exactly. and we're grappling with, for example, here, you're actually stuck that you can't even drop the link in. And so there's yeah. that hook, there's that like pleading with somebody, Hey, go do something that's a little bit deeper. I, I always, I said in the staff channel, I said, Katie is to me, a master of deep takes. And so the irony is that she's responsible for all of our hot takes and the, like the short, quick summaries of these things. But I think this is something even where a lot of cities really struggle is they, they have dense technical materials, or they have these types of, of challenges that like are big and yet trying to reduce them to the length of a tweet is actually maybe not the way to do it. Like you don't want to reduce the complexity to just like 150 characters or however many um, Master uh, Elon allows now. But how do you grapple with like density of information plus like capturing attention? Yeah, um, I think, so this is a good example if you want to focus on this average driving speed because this one did quite well on Instagram. It also did quite well at bringing people to the optical narrowing article which is a little bit deeper. Um, and this is a lot of where like the meaty, heady part of my work is. And it, it looks really simple. And in some sense, it is really simple. You have the same street, but you have paint on the street and you just have the average driving speed, 45 miles per hour to 25 miles per hour, which was reduced just by this process of optically narrowing the street. Um, but the meat of my job here is how do I take 
this article, which is about a concept that's kind of complex, optical narrowing, and tell a story that is a story in and of itself, just in an image. Mm -hmm. Like, because the image on social media needs to stand alone as a piece of content for the vast majority of people who aren't going to read the article. It can't just be a teaser for the article. Um, so that's where, that, that's where a lot of my work is. Like, how do I communicate this story about like a change that was made to a street in something that is maybe only seven words <laughs> visually. And then I have a little bit more in the caption depending on how much I can grab people's attention there and then potentially hook people into the article. So there's a lot, there's a lot that goes into that and there's a lot that goes into balancing you know, the, the story in the image, something that is even more informative in the caption because more people will, will see that as well. And that's kind of the goal is to have people understand um, and then have people go deeper to the article. Uh, so you have to reveal all those things, but not all at once. <laughs> so there's still some mystery left to read the rest so that people actually get the nuance. That's, yeah, that's a lot of the, the fun part for me. <laughs> yeah, oh, that's great. And Danny, I saw your question about specific platforms. We'll jump into that in a moment, but I wanna pull back a little bit. Like what are some of the guiding principles or guardrails that sh shape the way that you approach each day's social media engagement efforts? Guiding principles and guardrails. Uh, one of the guiding principles is I want to make sure that I have at least one post per day that just is for the social media following and, and isn't about you know trying to have people read something else or anything like that, but just you know really is for you know what people on that platform want to be seeing and want to be reading. Um, but I think. I'll go a little bit deeper with the guidelines and, and guardrails here. Um, a lot of what I go back and forth with and, and, and what, what you play with is, is on social media, usually things that are more simplistic, um, sometimes even more inflammatory are going to spread more quickly. And that's not who Strong Towns is as an organization. It's, it's not an organization that's simplistic or inflammatory. So how can we communicate complexity and nuance and like goodness and, and information, <laughs> be informative in a way that's also punchy? Uh, these are like the real, yeah, th these are some of the real governing dynamics and guardrails. Uh, and a lot of what, like day to day is the inspiration for my social media is the content that our, our writers create because they, there's just such a, there's always a wealth of things on our site to pull from any given day. Um, I think more of the mental energy is in like, curation and, and choosing what to do and how to create what's gonna make a good fast story that can go into a deeper story um, than, yeah, the, 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 yeah, there's really just like a wealth of a wealth of things that could go out. Yeah. What well, and I'll, I'll share, I mean, just two examples where, you know, this was an article that Chuck wrote. There's, you know, it's a deep, deep sort of piece where he's really grappling with, hey, you know, come on, folks, we need to like step back maybe from some of the strategies that other participants or actors in the movement are using. And so it's like, okay, we need, we need to go for like a direct approach, make this a culture war and we all lose. Like that's the title yeah. of the headline. And then you've got another one where you're having a little bit of fun and playing into like internet culture of people need to know who, you know, what fake London means within the not just bikes world. Um, and also to say like, there's actually, it isn't just like taking a shot. It's saying like, there's there's good things happening in London and we can expect uh, that uh, to, to shape up. But um, yeah, just the, it to me, it's fascinating. And so maybe touch on um, for, especially our local conversations who lack uh, the capacity to do say a daily post. Um, do you have suggestions on how to sort of use, uh, what are some of the highest sort of return on investment types of, social media efforts uh, that can be made? Is it the the daily check-in like, hey, let's you know schedule 15 posts to go out over the next like three weeks? Or is it a situation where you should just like um, delegate it? W what do you have uh, as, as suggestions on that? Mm, that's a really good question. Different cadences work really well for, for mm -hmm. different 
social media platforms. So there's not really a one size fits all answer here. I think that if you have limited time and resources to devote to social media, uh, the most important thing is thinking about who, what, what is the audience uh, that you think that your, your group would connect with the most? Um, what is your purpose behind um, behind using social media? And that'll help guide what platform you focus on and, and what kinds of content that you create. So I think that right now, probably of the, you know, the major social media platforms to focus on the highest leverage ones are Instagram, Twitter, and TikTok, uh, which we're not on actively currently. Um, Instagram is a social media platform that has a tendency to build a, a regular audience and you get longer comments and discussions and, and you can get kind of an engaged discussion going. Twitter is great because <laughs> something that's unique about it is every reply is also basically a public post. And so it's a place since it's so many quick scans um, and it has that nature. If you're interested in connecting with media, politicians, um, things like that, I think Twitter is probably the place to be. Um, still, although that's, that's kind of changing in tradition and like switching to other platforms. Um, and then TikTok, obviously the short form video, um, is like a highly, like a, a platform with like high growth and high virality potential, especially if you're interested in connecting with younger people. Um, I would say if you can only do, if I could only do a couple posts a week, um, because you're not able to get that kind of high like high cadence and then like higher likelihood for certain things to go viral. Um, I would focus on, and if I were an, an individual or you know, running a community where um, you felt comfortable kind of being the face of it, I think that even casual uh, selfie cam, just talking to a camera very like w without much production value about what's going on, um, but sharing things that you find interesting, like very sincerely, if, if you can only do a few things per week, uh, that would probably be the growth strategy that I would utilize because of the way that um, the video is favored in algorithms by Instagram and, and also TikTok obviously right now, but especially on Instagram, there's growth potential there. And if, if you can only do a couple of things, um, then, kind of by necessity, right. you you need to go for a depth over breadth strategy. That can work really, really well. Um, and if you, if you don't have the, the, the time to make really polished things um, and you, you don't have the time for like high cadence, I think that personal connection would be mm -hmm. the best way to go. I've certainly seen that in my social media feeds that when I'm regular in posting as an individual, my posts tend to do better than if I'm posting on behalf of Delpop, the local conversation group here. And there's mm -hmm. almost this distance like on LinkedIn, which I mean, is an old fogey sort of place. Well, um, but uh, I mean, each of them have sort of their different sort of characteristics. And I, I find I shouldn't call LinkedIn an old fogey place, but it's like it's different. It's not fun in the way that some of these other ones are. But it's a place where I, I found that there's a lot of like interest in what is maybe more serious or what you would expect uh, to be sort of on the front page of uh, a business newspaper and things like that. Anyways, um, I wanted to ask like, what's next for social media and for Strongtown's ideas on social media in particular? Sort of if you're looking ahead, uh, what do you see as either trends or or even part of our strategy that you want to share um, going forward? Like what's next? Or are we just responding to shifts, a, a ban on TikTok or whatever happens uh, around us? Good question. Yeah, what's next for Strongtown social media? So I'll say that I came I came into this organization. I think it's been a little bit. It's been it's been about four months. Mm -hmm. So uh, mostly what I've been doing so far is getting a feel for how our social media was. You know, trying out different things, mostly within our format. I think what's next is <laughs> I can't answer that question in a, in, a, in a super great way because what's next is continued experimentation. Um, I want to see what it looks like for us to foray more into video content and how sustainable that would be for us. We're trying to figure out a, a way for that to work. That, that's something that's a priority for me over the course of the year. Um, but really internally what's next with Strongtown social media, I think is 
I haven't talked about this yet. Um, there's the visual side, like you see what, what's posted on the social media feed. Um, and that is a huge component of growth, but another like massive strategy for growth on social media is what you're doing to engage with other social media creators, other social media platforms to enter other conversations that are not your own and not on your feed through commenting. Mm -hmm. This is often a way to like not only get new followers, but to connect your conversation with conversations that are outside of your niche that might have some overlap. Um, so that is like experimentation towards video on our social media side, I think is something that you'll see eventually, like slowly, um, because it can be a high effort thing. Um, but then on the other side, like what I'm really focused on is like what kinds of communities can strong towns connect with on social media, like via comments um, to you know, just forge connections um, with with other parts of the internet. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. Um, and that ties in, what what advice do you have for residents who want to be more helpful or engage in good faith on these social media platforms? Like, And and maybe a second part is, what advice do you have for groups like our local conversations uh, that seek the same but find it to be more complicated when, say, multiple hands are involved in the process of sharing a message or participating on these platforms? Um, what Yeah, if, if I'm starting a local conversation or I'm three years into it, uh, what advice do you have for me? Okay, you're starting a local conversation or you're three years into it on social media. I think that the best advice I could give to someone who's who's starting out and who it wants to use social media to connect with more people. Um, okay, I'm gonna divide this into two parts. Like one is kind of like yeah, in the way that you relate and then and then one is more tactical. Um, just in terms of, in, in the way of relating, um, I think everyone at Strong Towns is really keeping this in mind, but especially once we go online, uh, we're, we're operating in a pretty polarized environment. Um, when people see your content for the first time, they might have no context for, for urbanism. And uh, like a lot of these social pl media platforms are really designed unintentionally, but unfortunately in a way that people get siloed into bubbles. And then when those bubbles interact, um, they talk over each other, misunderstand each other and trigger each other. Um, so my, my best advice would be to try to be generous on social media with, with people who disagree with you um, and like err on the side of you not being antagonistic, even when like strongly putting forth your view. Like if you, if we can put forward Strong Town's views in a way that will be like most appealing to everyone and, and doesn't need to take shots at anyone that we don't need to. Um, that's, yeah, I think that's really important advice um, and, and, and something worth reiterating, even though it's kind of a cl cliche, but I, I think it's worth reiterating, especially as you're moving into social media because <laughs> the algorithms will reward you for doing the opposite thing. Right, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but what, when you're trying, what you're really trying to do is like, build your strong town, right? And social media is like a means of communication to help you do that. So like always keeping the long-term vision in mind that we're, what you're actually hoping to do is to use these channels to connect with people in person well, and like a, a broad diversity of people to be able to work together to transform your place. Yeah. Um, so always keeping that in mind, even if the algorithm is like, you know, giving you other feedback. Um, and then tactically, maybe this is something, I don't know if you sent out an email after this, I can, um, yeah. this in a package to share. Um, I think that for local conversations groups, and this isn't to say not to run your own social media pl platforms, absolutely do. Um, but there are some tactics that I think might be higher leverage. Um, if you don't already have a following and if you, if, if you think you might not have the bandwidth to really, you know, like do a consistent thing to build a following, um, because it does, it, it does take quite a bit, <laughs> um, there are some really high leverage tactics that would involve following people with slightly larger followings, not so overwhelming that you'll never be seen in the comments, but slightly larger followings in your local area, um, commenting early on their posts insightfully hmm. and with like statistics and, and like thinking, or, you know, thinking of your comment as almost like a lead to your platform huh. um, yeah. on social media. Um, 
And yeah, so like the, sa the same kind of principles that we talked about with the post, you know, like having something that's kind of punchy, tells a story immediately, leaves a little bit of mystery. Don't tell them to go click on your profile because nobody likes feeling marketing to or marketed to, um, unless you have something like really relevant to share, then, then go for it, you know, just feel it out how it's appropriate. Um, but I think that's kind of an undervalued method, um, especially if there's someone with us with a larger following, but is approachable enough that, you know, there aren't going to be a hundred comments within three seconds. <laughs> um, if you can follow accounts like that, that talk about similar issues or compatible issues, even if they're from a different perspective, comment thoughtfully, have your you know profile logo there, have your bio optimized, and then have your content kind of at the top of your feed, you know, be something that would be interesting to people. Uh, that's a, a really strong growth tactic. And even if you're not doing it for the channel, if you're trying to say, you, you might keep a pretty small social media mm -hmm. following because maybe you don't have the bandwidth to do this, but if you're trying to promote an event, say, <laughs> um, when your event is coming up that week, the top thing in your feed, the first thing that people would see is an invitation to this event. You're going out on more popular social media platforms um, that are local to your area within that week and being really active in the comments in ways that are engaging. That is probably gonna be a better way to get people to see your event if you just have more energy to do that right then then um then then just posting it on your channel that is fascinating i, I i'm gonna go leave and go take care of our event uh <laughs> so because we've got stuff coming up and i'm like oh that is such an interesting approach and i really like that um method and even I mean, we have, especially in the local level, you'll have very, various city council members. Some will be using, uh, you know, actively on social media and and to their credit, engaging in, in a healthy or generous way and then finding ways to connect with them. There, there's some great um, guidance there. And it's also, you don't then have to think, what am I going to post about today? You more react or take an opportunity uh, to look at what other people have already posted and say like, oh, well, there's another way of thinking about this. There's, there's another angle to this. Um, someone said that uh, they appreciate the the chuck reacts post which i think is yeah. very similar in that that sort of vein on on that yeah. approach um at, at this point i want to sort of pivot into a couple of the questions and and sort of open it up as well as if anybody wants to jump in uh just raise your hand in the uh the zoom platform and we can do this but the, uh danny was asking like hey what should we um uh, to get a better feel for how to decide what a platform what platform gets what message and when or whether to duplicate and I think that's always capacity, you know, of it, depending on your available capacity. He said like a 10 minute video about a bad road on YouTube, 60 seconds of that on Instagram with a link to YouTube. Uh, can you talk about why batching and sort of duplicating on all of the platforms feels like the right way to go about it, but can sometimes be counterproductive? Maybe I'm uh, shading the answer a little bit too much. So go ahead and take, take it more generally, but yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I batch content across the social media platforms. And this is, again, this is a bandwidth capacity issue, um, but also I, I think it can work quite well. Um, there are some drawbacks to it. Um, yeah, which direction do I wanna take this? So if you if you wanna be in all of these places, like pragmatically, uh, the thing to do is definitely to, to make one piece of content that can be used in several different ways and images and squares. <laughs> are a format uh, that most platforms like well enough. You know, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, yeah. and uh, LinkedIn all dig images in, in squares with, with captions, even if it's not their most native. Um, so that's one good way to do that. Um, but yeah, I would say if you're making a 10 minute YouTube video and then trying to make shorts out of it, um, this can be done, uh, but to do it effectively usually takes a lot of editing. Um, and that's something that we've been experimenting with because we have such phenomenal uh, YouTube content. You know, how could we leverage this on social media? And it, it's more of a challenge than you might think. Because um, if you're trying to translate that to something that's gonna work in 30 seconds, a video that's gonna work in 30 seconds needs to have a very different 
kind of structure. You really need to start with something that is like very much a hook right away. And then you need to be kind of like building interest and tension throughout the 30 seconds because on social media, the actual user experience is people can scroll past your thing at any, at any instant in, you know, like a millisecond. Um, and in every single moment that they're watching your video, they are deciding whether or not to do that. Uh, so this is like a fundamentally different format than YouTube. And uh, we haven't found that taking clips from YouTube directly does super well, unless you're watching the video and you really zero in and you say, oh, this is a hook and then I can cut this thing and then I can cut this thing. And at that point, it might actually just be lower effort to record a 30 second re reaction video to your own video. Um, yeah, that I'm not sure that answered the question directly, but is that yeah. <laughs> kind of and what you're looking for there? I yeah. think the idea of that reaction is maybe one of the po points I wanted to just uh, jump in as well, is that it's one thing to just post a link and almost have that link just be the the only thing that you're posting, say on LinkedIn or on on Facebook, but to actually provide a snippet of why you as a local or you as a resident have found this to be interesting. I've used that as my strategy for whenever I email local city councilors or members of city staff an email. I will always introduce it with like I'll grab out a little quote or an excerpt in part to be like this is worth clicking to because it's got this type of content in it. But I'll also say, hey, I know we're dealing with this. I know it's a big issue. I believe that we could actually help ourselves by considering some of the options that are presented in this article, for instance, and then just like go there. And email allows you to do that a little bit more, although not in a public setting in that way. And there can be um, quite a bit of, of yeah value in, in taking that on. Uh, but Richard in Walla Walla, in Walla, Walla sorry, um, do you want to jump in and uh, offer thoughts or questions? Once you're unmuted. Oh, did we lose him? No. Is he here? Where's Richard? Richard, you're on mute. It didn't catch. Now I caught. Okay, I caught. Very good. Okay. I'm going to try to edit myself, which is really good, good training here, and not tell you other than today's blowing my mind because I'm looking about starting a, a setting up a studio, recording studio, but I don't know who, which audience it will project out to. So this is like amazing. Mm -hmm. But I spent my career as a tour director, so I'm very comfortable speaking. And I learned how working with groups, you have to read them. And I then started taking classes at Antioch University in Seattle. And the mo number one class I took was in, well, it was in storytelling. But the whole point was the very first thing that this amazing uh, 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 professor was, we're not here to learn to tell, to, to be storytellers. We are here to learn to tell stories. And it was the art of telling stories. And in that, there's so much uh, editing that goes on to get it down to exactly what you're talking about. So if that can be coming from a slightly different perspective, but it's the same thing of taking something like, oh yeah, we love, we love storytelling. No, we love telling stories. And at first it's like, well, what's the difference? It's a huge difference. It's this art and it's this simplicity and it's editing. So if that helps people as we all try to learn how to edit and grab people, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. And maybe this is one of the areas where being a personality is part of your story when you're posting. And that can be, I you know, we've tried to do this with our group is to actually have like Norm is posting this or Max is posting this for a group. And, and you kind of get that flavor a little bit uh, rather than sort of the organization. Uh, and, and there's good, you know, there's probably bad ways to do it. But if you can be a bit of a persona or a caricature or a character, rather, uh, there can be um, some interesting sort of connection points there uh, that uh, that can help you. Danny, over to you uh, down in Sarasota. Yeah, thanks for all that, Katie. That was a, a hitting kind of what on, on, on what I was trying to get at with how to pick platforms where I you know, came into a little bit of this where trying to show uh, poor traffic design and poor city design around our place, places that need improvement in our local area. And uh, one of my kids said, well, cause I like, I don't know how to edit and I don't know how to do these things. And uh, 
He's like, well, just do it. And then you'll figure it out as you go along. So, okay. So we did that and made some YouTube stuff. And that's when I found out that, yeah, like you said, editing takes a long time. It's, it's a lot of work. And yeah. then another kid, another one of my kids said, well, you should put that on Instagram. And I wasn't, had I had an Instagram account, never really used it, had to go, had them show me what is it? What is it like? Oh, okay. Now I get it. So now I don't have to, I, I think I get it. Um, uh, where if I see a bus stop that's in the sun all the time and no one wants to be there, that I can take a selfie in front of that, lay out the, here's why I'm doing this. And there it goes. And people can yeah. see that. And it's very quick and I can do it while I'm on a trip somewhere. Like yeah. while I'm on the bus going somewhere, it's not that I have to take a week to collect footage to another week to do the editing, to put a 10 minute video together about why and how our bus stops could be better. Uh, then another kid said, well, that should totally go on TikTok. And I'm like, I don't even have a TikTok account. So how do I pick now? Where, what do I put on TikTok versus putting it on Instagram? And I have an, a LinkedIn account, but I've never really thought of it for this kind of thing. I've thought of that as where do I go get programming jobs kind of stuff. Right. Um, and so I'm, I find, I see what you mean about not uh, like, like just taking a snippet and dropping it into another platform isn't probably it isn't the way to go most of the time um unless there's a specific small topic that comes out of that like that youtube video this 12 seconds really tells a standalone story all by itself then okay yeah. uh, but it's more of other than length and it's like youtube or everything else is how it seems to fall do i have a 10 minute story or a 30 minute story about how to get my 84 year old mother on her walker to go from her doctor's office to lunch across the street, across the nine lane strode uh, versus this bus stop needs uh, yeah. a better work. Yeah. So that's why I still kind of, other than length of presentation and I don't want, I don't really want to miss everybody either. Cause I realized when the kids told me, Oh, this should be on Instagram. And I'm sort of like, what's Instagram. There could be all sorts of things going on there. I'd never seen and was never aware of. Yeah. So I want to spread it wide to catch people like me that are only on a platform or two, but not the carpet bomb or not. A, so I don't know. I still don't have a great feel for that for when I have a an idea or a topic or a piece of media. How do I pick where to put it? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, let me let me speak to kind of a different perspective on thinking about social media <laughs> here. Um, and I hope that this doesn't come across as confusing or contradictory because really with, with social media, like with anything, it's kind of like asking like, how do you make, I, I don't know, you know how, do you, how do you make a good piece of art? Well, some of them are just lines on a canvas and some of them are elaborate, you know, super detailed and like all of these things can land really well. Um, so what you're telling me and this is probably more applicable to people in, in local conversations. Um, I'm just gonna speak to a trend that makes me really happy about what I'm seeing on social media. Um, and I think could be a good way forward to invest in, especially if you're an individual, um, is like the, the, the trend of people just appreciating unedited, not extremely optimized, um, just someone talking to them sincerely about what they care about briefly with the thing in the background, or even you know, Zoom does these quasi green screens. You see like the, the wobbly cutout, you can be talking over an article that you're talking about that impacted you or something like that. Um, there's definitely a rising trend of these aesthetics and editing and, and all of these things not really mattering. Um, and we can talk about like optimizing for each profile, um, but if you are an individual who's trying to connect with people on social media and even some of the, the biggest social media accounts these days, like a lot of the biggest social media accounts these days are like this, really are just a person for 30 seconds to a minute, 30 seconds at a time talking about something that's mattering to them, like very, very sincerely um, and, and, and sharing that pretty openly. Um, and I think if you, if you go with a strategy like that, a strategy, it's not, it's not even really a strategy at that point, but if, if that's the kind of social media that you go for, it can really free you 
there's a bit of a risk in it if, you, if you're trying to represent an, an organization, obviously, um, but it can really free you from a lot of the work, a lot of the edit, a lot of the overthinking and a lot of the barriers between you and the people that you're ultimately trying to connect with. <laughs> like, I think at the end of the day, like we're all coming around to, we actually just want to be interacting with real people. Um, that seems to be where culture is going, I hope. Um, and so that might be a way to think about it. And when it comes to what platforms, um, you know, like Instagram and TikTok are probably going to resonate with that kind of style the best, but there's certainly nothing wrong with posting it to LinkedIn and seeing what happens so long as you feel comfortable with that being on your professional profile. Um, there's nothing wrong with posting those things to Twitter and seeing what happens. Um, and kind of, if I can go meta, like taking a little bit of a strong towns approach of it, you know, just doing something small and seeing how things react um, because uh, yeah, seeing how, seeing how people react um, because there are broad trends across social media. There are many strategies that like have a tendency to work if you are, you know, like willing to apply a lot of effort and you're trying to do a lot of things at once. Um, but, well, you know, you, you don't necessarily have to either. Does, does that, does that help? Uh, well, it helps to not worry, not worry about overproducing things, which I have no worries about that. Uh, yeah. yeah. And I, I find yeah. a lot of the stuff I produce is as much for a reference, a, uh, a conversation reference. So I know that when I'm talking to the county planners and I have a problem with a particular intersection, I can say, go look at this channel, go look at this posting, mm -hmm. and that will lay out where I went and stood on the side of the road and did a video and talked about the thing I'm talking about yeah. rather than having to try and explain it uh, uh, poorly and uh, without the visuals yeah. right there in front of them. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes you know, making something longer on YouTube is more for that purpose than for trying to get a ton of people to see it on YouTube. It's for when you have the opportunity to talk to someone in city council, you can have them pull something up on their phone that they can watch later right away and and that can be you know more of an impact than thousands of people from across the country seeing it um so so yeah that, that's that's something to think about as well and i, I just want to say too like with, with starting out like don't be afraid of posting unoptimized things or things on the wrong channel you know the platform is going to give you feedback over time understand too that for a long time when you're doing these you're probably not going to get a whole lot of <laughs> A whole lot of likes or feedback at all and it's all okay you know it's if you look at any social media platform including our own you see an arc of change and development over time and it usually doesn't start out great so don't yeah if don't, don't be afraid yeah. to don't be afraid to just like post it to places that you don't think will work you know if you need inspiration, um, watch The Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt and you need to be Titus Andronicus. Like, I'm going to be famous. And just that is the character. I know that's a bit of a, a very ob oblique reference, but uh, Alan, over to you. Uh, thoughts or questions? Yeah, thank you. Um, I'm the vice president of public relations for my uh, Toastmaster club. And we use Meetup, Facebook and LinkedIn. And I only launched LinkedIn a little while ago, maybe about three months ago. And the thought was to reach out to uh, more of the professional community to, especially for Toastmasters, assuming that people are trying to improve their communication, speaking, leadership skills, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And we're getting tremendous uh, results out of that. And I'm assuming that, you know, I haven't been started a strong towns group in South Surrey yet, but that's my ambition is uh, wanting to reach out to that professional community and Norm, I think at one point you talked about, you know, being able to maybe even reach out to city planners and other um, city staff through those channels uh, through LinkedIn. So I'm wondering about its efficacy for that. Uh, I'm getting great results for our Toastmasters Club. I'm wondering if it's um, potential. What is its potential for a strong towns group? Thanks. Yeah, I, I think that that, that sounds like a really great starting point. Um, when you have something that's working really well for you, like it, it sounds like your Toastmasters group is, is able to connect really well on LinkedIn with a particular you know, group of people that you think are also the sorts of people that you would wanna connect with to start a strong towns group. Um, 
that's that's great potentiality to to segue absolutely um i'm curious with the toastmasters group how appropriate it would be to ask if it's okay to share within that group um but yeah i i, I think I have like few words to say here, but if you have something that you know that you can do well and it's working well for you in, in one way, um, then then yes, do it, <laughs> do it for your strong towns group as well. And that's that's likely to work because these things are so particular to the person and the location and the exact community that you're trying to connect with that if you if you have if you have some energy in in one way of do, connecting on social media um don't let anyone tell you that your strong towns group should be on instagram because that's how strong towns group should be yeah well if i can briefly uh, offer what i did was i wanted to set it up so it would be sustainable so what i do is no matter what role i'm playing in in the actual toastmasters meeting i sneak up my camera and take photos of all the different roles and then i write a, an article that describes the meeting so that any um, one who's new to Toastmasters would get a general sense of what is, what are the different roles and what is a Toastmaster meeting all about. And I'm able to su support that on a weekly basis. So I end up with about six to eight photos and wow. maybe about a 800 word write up. And that's sustainable. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, that's amazing. And, and it seems to be working. As I say, we, we get a regular stream of new guests and whatnot, but uh, yeah. I'm really hoping to reach out to that professional community and again, with the idea of a strong counts group is I'm hoping and assuming that those are the people you want to uh, reach to that may actually have some influence or effect or might be, you know, influential in, in the community some way. Yeah. Uh, not just, you know, uh, uh, getting a, a grassroots young people neighborhood uh, uprising, but maybe, you know, some key elements as well. Yeah, it really, it really, like, that's a powerful group, an important group to connect with. Um, and I could see that kind of I could see that kind of method that you're doing, especially if that's sustainable for you. Because for many people, writing an 800 word article per week would sound extremely intimidating, whereas shorts on TikTok wouldn't. So it, this is why this is so individualized. But it, I could see that being really powerful if you had a local strong towns group doing something similar with the attendees, like write ups of who they are and what they're doing. Um, since you already know how to make this kind of content and do it well in a way that connects with people in your local area, that, yeah, that sounds like a a beautiful <laughs> strategy to try yeah and then uh donna how about uh comments or questions well yeah i'm not ashamed to say i don't really know anything about technology so you know that's not my field but uh we are fortunate with our local conversation uh we have a state university here 20,000 students, and you tap into those young people, and the message gets out. And I think that that's how, over the last year and a half or two years, that the Strong Towns message has gotten out in our community. And yeah, we have all sorts of messages um, and platforms. So I, I'm not on Instagram and all that, but I do follow the Facebook. And yeah, they post regularly and people comment regularly. So everything you said is, is, you know, spot on. So I want everybody to do what she says. So <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Thank you. And then Eric uh, down in Denton, Texas. Sure. Thanks, Norm. Um, so I, I guess, uh, well, one comment for, for finding people, I've found that, you know, university is great. Uh, actually, one of our best source of knowledgeable, helpful people has been municipal staff members of neighboring towns who happen to live in the town we are in. Uh, depending on how high level their position is, sometimes they can't be super visible, but, uh, but they're definitely good resources for uh, helping you, you know, figure out what to do and what not to do. Um, my question, I guess, is more of a um, what ways do you think would be successful in conscripting uh, people within our local conversations to help out? 
uh, in low effort ways. For instance, I'm trying to think of ways to get people just to take photos of interesting stuff they see in town or, you know, a small video segment, like you were saying, if they don't mind sharing their thoughts and then aggregating that content together, because mm -hmm. I find that I would have like, like we typically see a lot more engagement out of stuff that is a picture or a video of a place everybody knows that's in town yeah. than just a random created photo or, or an article link to something. Right. Um, yeah. But it takes a whole lot of time and just, you know, mental energy to, to try to collect all of that, all those ideas yourself. Mm -hmm. So is, is there any strategy as far as tools to ask people to, upload stuff to or how to be successful in getting that kind of energy happening? Good question. Um, this is kind of the holy grail of crowdsourced content. Um, and it's, it's something that um, we'd be interested in as well, but we haven't quite gotten the flow with. Um, I would say if I were maybe something that you could try depending on what your capacity would be as a local conversation group. Um, if you do things like host Jane's walks or like things where you actually walk around your town, um, <laughs> I've always found that the best way to get a large group of people to do something is to do it with them. And then it's really fun. Um, and that might sound intimidating, but like the amount of work that you might put into trying to set up a whole system and then like remind people to use it and asking people to use it, it might actually just be, this is what I think. I, I can't say for certain, but I, having run meetups in the past, um, <laughs> I would think that the best way to do this would be to host like a fun walk through the city, like once a month or however often you want to do it, where you're just all taking photos of interesting things together. And then you have like a second meetup where it's kind of like a fun, like a caption contest that you're like doing. Um, and maybe you'll do this quarterly or something like that. Um, and and then to actually translate that to social media, then the last step, which could be pretty quick, would be putting this in templates. Um, and this is not a resource that I have for local conversations yet, um, but one of my projects that you guys can hope for, we're aiming for end of the month, but let's say before May, <laughs> is um, some kind of social media template kit on Canva, which is a really easy photo editing thing for anyone to use. So um, that would be, if my goal were to herd cats, I think that would be how I would try it. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that we've had some success with, but need to double back on is, is we did a work party where we basically just generated a whole bunch of different social media posts with some of our pictures. And the idea was we did it virtually over a Zoom and it was creating a, com a composite sort of like D directory of sorts of all of the different posts that we could schedule. And then Buffer is allows you to post up to 10 posts on three different platforms for free. And that can be quite useful because then you can schedule it out, set it and forget it. It can be, you know, one every four days and that that will actually cover you for quite a while with the reminder to check in. And the biggest block for me is that I schedule 10 and then I don't have the next 10 ready. And that's where that work of actually having pre-populated it. And then you can do your hot take on some developing project um, and squeeze it in there or like, hey, we've got an event that we didn't plan on, but the rest of the time it can actually already be pre-populated. -pre and so that's like a, a layman's version of if you're doing scrappy, if you're herding cats, um, if you don't have a professional sort of background in it, uh, there, there's some ways to just make it a little bit easier so that you use a, a portion of focus and a really concentrated time and then let that like play out. It's sort of, you know, my mother would, uh, you know, can. And so that way she didn't have to be like dealing with fresh vegetables for, you know, through the winter months. It would, we'd have, you know, sloppy beans. Um, I, I, I didn't like canned food. I should not uh, complain. And this is not a food podcast. So um, over to you, Andrew, um, spare me from my reminiscing. <laughs> That's okay. My mother is a terrible cook, so um, <laughs> I didn't eat any of her food. Um, <laughs> my coworker is laughing in front of me. Um, so um, more so on like the messaging and getting different demographics than usually are attracted to the uh, to the I would say new Britainism movement. Um, do you have any good suggestions on how to attract demographics outside of what we would normally be attracting? So. Um, for my local conversation, we 
Um, we've had some success with like linking with other organizations to attract stronger demographics, um, but that like those linkages are not showing through within social medias. Um, we do post on a couple of different platforms. So we do use LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram. We utilize a TikTok occasionally. Um, it's not a focus just because it's, it, yeah, it's in an interesting, we don't really have a time to really like focus on too many platforms. So we do specialize in like Instagram, um, Facebook and um, LinkedIn, um, as well as doing like a regular blast in our website. Um, <clears throat> but we've always struggled at getting the not standard demographic um, for kind of the stuff that we're doing um, onto the platforms. Um, do you have suggested messaging or word tracks um, that would assist with that? That's a good question. Um, so yeah, it's kind of a challenge, especially because social media, it, it tends to put you in a bubble and like the communities that you connect with in person, it doesn't necessarily translate to social media. These things can look really different. Um, Two suggestions that come to mind. Um, I would say on social media, follow uh, follow groups that tend to attract, attract the demographics that you're interested in connecting with um, and see what kinds of content that they're making and are there ways that you can emulate the style that they're using because the stuff can be quite localized. And then going back to that commenting um, strategy that I talked about earlier, um, that would be maybe something that you would want to do because even if you have the right language and messaging, um, part, part of how social media works is it, it, it gives you to more people who are already like the people that like you. And this is kind of like a self-fulfilling spiral that's just kind of challenging to escape. Uh, and the thing to do, um, which is kind of challenging to do is you actually want to like break the flow of information and like the flow of travel to your channel. <laughs> um, by not just posting where you are, but like posting elsewhere. Um, something that's good on Instagram is you can do collaborative posts. So if you have organizations that you are connected with in your local area, um, you can create a joint post. Um, sometimes the easiest way to herd cats to do this is just to create a post that you think they're gonna like and say, hey, do you wanna go on this, in on this with me? It's a post on both of our platforms. You can go back and forth like that. And that actually shows up on both of your feeds and, and links you both to each other. Um, but yeah, actually, I, I think that people do, especially if you're talking about smaller channels, just under underestimate the power of like commenting and getting in conversations with people online and other platforms. Um, yes. Uh, before, does that answer your question? Does that, does that help? Yeah, kind of. Okay. Um, yeah, we, we just, I think like when it comes down to even like in-person meetings, when we have joint meetings with some organizations, we do still struggle with some of the the um the messaging um on our end I, it's we all come like my entire organize like our entire local conversation is pretty much one demographic um and we're all of similar background we're all college educated and so like we don't have the lived experience and we're overly aware of it um but we don't have a good way of adjusting to it um right now and we try to invite more and more voices into our leadership core and get them a little bit more diverse but we've struggled with that especially in a city like Grand Rapids where like the yeah. BIPOC community is literally just being priced out <laughs> like we come in there and we're like yeah but we want walkable streets and stuff and they're like but you're pricing us out um, right. right associated with but, yeah. yeah yeah so working within like a more hostile I would say demographic maybe no that makes sense I mean, these are these are like really deep these are really deep challenges um I'm not not answering to try to avoid them, but I think uh, it's hard to give generic advice for the situation because I think it's something that everyone struggles with, especially once you become associated with a certain kind of bubble. Um, like at the end of the day, I think building relationships is about building trust with real people. Um, and so, I think if you want to connect with people who are skeptical of the strong towns movement, you know, think that it's only like a certain kind of people who are interested in it, think that it's actually like counter to counter to the needs of poor people or people of color, like um, maybe showing up at at, at their events and uh, listening and engaging and connecting that way and 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 making friends. Um, I like what I feel like I'm giving obvious or generic advice and and, and things that are. Kind of hard but um and maybe not social media related but 
that the challenge is a, it's a self-fulfilling challenge, right? Because people see then what your group looks like and then they say, oh, this isn't for me. So, but once you're able to cross those boundaries, which it sounds like you already have been and have been doing like a great job, like every bit that you do can can open the door a little bit more for, for more people to be interested in strong towns. And I, I think there is a tipping point um, where like with a certain amount of diversity um, and diverse perspectives within a movement, like it no longer gives off a visual impression that it's for a particular kind of people. Um, and then like, you'll see kind of like, like an, a non-linear flip flipping, you know, um, yeah. where like, like you have to do a, a lot of effort for, for some time before things change. I, I don't know if other people have more to say on this, but. Yeah, and I think we're like as an organization, like a local organization, we're relatively successful with linking with organizations of different backgrounds and different communities and that kind of stuff and standing with them and like working, going to their events and they come to our events and that kind of stuff. It's more on like like on our social media, like I mean I our social medias are very monogamous when it comes down to the demographics that we're that we seem to have like, like we have people following. Um, they're like we haven't attracted other demographics um, but like in physical person like when working with our community and stuff like that um, is where we found success in working with different people of different backgrounds and that kind of stuff and working with different organizations that are skewed one demographic or the other um, yeah I think probably a better person to ask to um, is or better people to ask to are the people that you are connected with in in-person communities have them take a look at your social media and like see what their feedback is yeah. like does this appeal to them does this not like what do they think of it um they yeah yeah sure uh yamini do you want to jump in as well sure i actually was gonna say i have similar challenges as andrew um with the added challenge of a lot of our members aren't we're locals now but we are transplants yep. um so we aren't like from from the city we are in and so I feel like that affects our how we're perceived a little bit um and then I'm in San Antonio which is a very large city and we all again all of our members tend to be more in like the inner core and so I'm struggling with reaching folks that don't live as close to downtown um, and then like the outlying districts. So that's uh, another challenge as well. I was wondering if you had any suggestions. The issue is we tend to have our events downtown because it's more accessible, but then people who don't live near don't come or it's just like things like that. So it's something I haven't quite figured out yet. Cause it can take, you yeah. know, like an hour to get across town sometimes. Yeah. So uh, that's been a challenge. Um, we're venturing into the terrain of having to run this another hour uh, on another <laughs> day, only be because it's a fantastic question. And it's definitely one of the ones I think um, we're for the local conversation leaders on the call too. we should definitely um, schedule another time for a bigger discussion of even those things, because sometimes it's going to have to be like a downtown group and then like a group that's like representing one of the Western suburbs and the Eastern suburbs, a uh, city like a size of San Antonio or Atlanta. I, in the ideal form, soon it will get to the point where you've got multiple groups sort of representing sort of different areas and then we're collaborating together because that scale is really challenging. We have that North Delta is feels very separated. It's a it's an hour bus ride to get to North Delta if you're going to go to an event up there uh, or vice versa when uh, folks from there come south to where I live. And so it just creates this division, this not division, but a, a challenge there. Um, but as we try to diversify and sort of build out that audience, some of it is um, there. I do think there's a question of tone and then I'll go to you, Donna, and then we'll wrap up is um, the question of how forceful do we present these things as like the firm conclusions of, hey, urbanism is now in the ascendancy within a very limited sort of world. Um, we now have, you know, the, the right answers and, and Strong Towns does always like have within it this like pulse of be humble, be humble, like be careful, um, embrace the the ambiguity at times, uh, which is why you need to like propose, let's just try the smaller things. And sometimes that can be the thing that 
um, removes some of the the fear or the aggression is like, oh, you're not asking to change the entire neighborhood. You're saying no neighborhood should be exempt from change, but no neighborhood should be subject to radical change. Oh, I can start to like frame that up uh, a little bit differently there. Um, but I know we're just past the hour. Uh, Donna, I, I'm going to throw it over to you uh, for final words. Well, I represent sprawl. I mean, that's yeah. I'm in a ward system. I represent sprawl. It takes me 20 minutes to get downtown and we're not even a big city. So um, Strong Towns is multifaceted. Yeah. What attracted me in the beginning really was uh, fiscal. You know, there are streets. We can't afford to take care of streets. We keep expanding. It's got to stop because we can't afford that. So you can attract a different demographic from that perspective than just bikeability, walkability, you know, somebody that's older, they can't necessarily walk two miles, you know, down Main Street to, from one place to another. So, you know, broaden all the different aspects within strong towns to attract more people. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. my suggestion. Yeah. Thank you, Donna. And with that, I'm going to say thank you so much, Katie. Uh, this was uh, super helpful. And certainly, I think a, a little taste of what it's like under the hood for strong towns. And then I love the way that we pivoted into the broader discussion of how do we make this practical, useful, and helpful for folks that are grappling with these things, uh, learning from some of the experiences that uh, Yamini talked about, or Andrew talked about, or Danny talked about. Uh, so thank you all for your participation. I feel like that's what makes for a good social media conversation even, is when everybody weighs in and has a role to play. And so thank you all for participating. And yeah, let's continue the conversation as we go forward. Really appreciate your time.